All right, so. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our final Fall into OBOB event. I'm Julie, the events manager at Roundabout Books in Bend, Oregon. If you're joining us from outside of Bend, we'd love to know what city you're in. Feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, there's just a few housekeeping items we need to cover before we get started. So this event is being recorded, as you heard her say. And we just want to remind everyone that if you don't want to be on video, um, to just turn that portion off. And then please remain muted unless you're asked to speak and then I will unmute you. But comments and questions are welcome in the chat screen throughout the event. And then we'll do a Q&A portion at the end. Before we get started, we do wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge that our bookstore in Bend, Oregon resides on the ancestral unceded land of the Confederate tribes of Warm Springs. In our immediate area are also the unceded land of the Confederate tribes of Siletz Indians and the tribes of Grand Ronde. We encourage everyone to learn more about the land you occupy and the story of its peoples. Uh, your local library and local independent bookstore are great resources for both of those uh, to look up those things. So to get to tonight's book, uh, we are talking with David Robertson about the Barren Grounds. So here's a little about the book. Narnia meets traditional indigenous stories of the sky and constellations in an epic middle grade fantasy series from award-winning author David Robertson. Morgan and Eli, two indigenous children forced away from their families and communities, are brought together in a foster home in Winnipeg, Manitoba. They each feel disconnected from their culture and each other and struggle to fit in at school and at their new home until they find a secret place walled off in an unfinished attic bedroom. A portal opens to another real reality, a sky, bringing them onto frozen barren grounds where they meet Ochek. The only hunter supporting his starving family, Misawa, Ochek welcomes the human children teaching them traditional ways to survive. But as the need for food becomes desperate, they embark on a dangerous mission. Accompanied by Eric, a sassy squirrel, they catch stealing from the trap line. They try to save Misawa before the icy grip of winter freezes everything, including them. So David Robertson was the 2021 recipient of the Writers Union of Canada Freedom to Read Award. The Barren Grounds, the first book in the middle grade, the Misawa Saga series, received a starred review from Kirkus was a Kirkus and Quill and Choir Best Middle Grade Book of 2020, was a US BBY and Texas Lone Star selection, was shortlisted for the Ontario Library Association's Silver Birch Award, and was a finalist for the 2020 Governor General's Literary Award. And now for Obob, uh, he is a member of the Norway House Cree Nation and currently lives in Winnipeg. Everyone, please welcome David Robertson. <laughs> so David, please tell us more about this book and you as a writer. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for my dad joke in the chat. I'm, uh, I'm famous for, for dad jokes here in Winnipeg, probably more so than for my writing. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy to, uh, to be, it's funny, I'm, I'm speaking to, uh, to you for a bookstore and I'm in a bookstore right now. I just, uh, I hosted another launch just this evening and, um, and I had to like, I had 15 minutes before I had to log into this one. So I stayed in the bookstore and they let me, they let me, uh, um, use their classroom here in the bookstore. So I'm, I am, I'm, in, I'm in Winnipeg right now. And, um, this is our first really cold night of the year. And it's, um, it's, you know, it's, Soon it's going to look like the barren grounds over here, starting to snow tonight. So, um, yeah, I'll tell you um, where the where the story came from and some of the the inspirations behind it, and then um, we'll uh, see what kind of questions you might have for me. But um, I, you know, this I think you know with any book you write, um, it comes from a different a number of different inspirations from book to book. It's almost like this collision of all these different things that you know that um, eventually push you into writing um, a story. And um, the Barren Grounds is a book that um, is my first middle grade book. Um, 
and it's the first in a series. So the Missawa Saga series is um, right now there's three books and I've just finished writing the fourth book um, just coming out next. There's going to be six books in total. So um, it's a it's a long series. It's hopefully not like, you know, when you say long, it's probably not. Hopefully it's exciting enough where it's, it's not like this is such a long series, but it's uh, it's going to be six books long. And um, it just was optioned by uh, D Disney uh, last year. So um, I'm hoping that you'll uh, get to see it on Disney Plus at some point, I think is what they're what the aim is for to see it as a TV series. Um, so that could happen in a couple of years or in five years or never. So, you know, that's the way TV works, but um, we're, uh, we're hoping it, uh, it happens. So it'll be kind of exciting to see who gets to play who and, and uh, I won't have much of a say, but I'll definitely be excited to watch it. Um, the, uh, the, so The Bearing Grounds was the first book in the series and The Bearing Grounds was a book that um, first and foremost, uh, even though Narnia is mentioned a lot uh, when you talk about the bearing, which is fair, um, Narnia was definitely a, a, an inspiration for it as well. Um, but the first, um, the first source of inspiration really was, I guess, first it would be like going out onto the land with my dad uh, a few years ago um, before he passed away, and we spent the land, uh, the day on the land on on his old trap line. And um, and I just I feel like there I got this really deep appreciation for like the earth <laughs> and and the importance of like sustaining it and the relationship that we have to it or the, I guess the relationship that we should be thinking more about that we have to to it. Um, you know I, I think the reality that we're seeing now is that you know if we don't treat the land a lot better. Um, then it has implications. So, you know, for example, Winnipeg, for it, for there to be no snow until tonight is very weird, um, you know. And I was just in Toronto for the last week, uh, and Toronto was like almost 20 degrees, and um, and it never should be that temperature this late in the year as well. So, um, so I think, and it, I think there's like this very important message about that. Um, through the Barren Grounds, but it's also um, one that I, you know, I, I think that I see, um, I became more aware of and appreciated more when I, uh, when I went onto the land and I kind of saw what that relationship means, what it looks like. And, and I think it really what, what the, I think the biggest thing that I got from it was that my dad said um, that we only took as much as we needed, you know, and I think that was a really important thing that he said, um, and I, and that really resonated with me. And so that was the first source of inspiration is just being there and living, you know, staying, you know, staying a day on there where my dad used to live and um, and thinking about the way we used to live, you know, out in nature um, and how we treated nature, you know, properly. Um, and then the last few years, I've been learning a lot about um, star stories, like tr traditional stories um, that indigenous people have of, of the constellations. And um, so Cree people have them and Ojibwe people and, and the Cree people have um, different stories for different constellations. We have different names for them. Usually they're animals. Um, so if you, you know, the most famous constellation probably is the Big Dipper. Um, which is Ursa Major, um, and in in the Cree version of it, it's um, it's about uh, an animal called a, fi a fisher. So a fisher animal is like a like a weasel or a marten um, or a, a muskrat, a little bit too in a way. Um, so it's in that family of animal. And if you look at the Big Dipper, the body of the animal is like that. Those four stars that kind of have that kind of boxy shape. And then the tail of the animal is, is the, uh, the three stars that kind of like, that um, are crooked. And the story of that constellation is how the fisher got placed into the sky and how his tail became broken. And there's um, a lot of different variations of that story. So if you go from like different Cree people to different Cree people, which is where I'm a Cree, I'm Cree um so they'll tell the story differently 
And then if you go to like an Ojibwe person, they'll tell the story differently because they have stories about the fisher as well. And so, I, and I've, I've learned all these different versions of it. And um, what I found is that uh, there's a lot of details that change, um, but there's things that always remain the same. So it's always uh, like a winter that they're trying to live through that never ends. Um, and it's always the fisher that saves the day. And, um, and he always gets his tail hit by an arrow um, after he frees the summer birds or, you know, so in some stories he chews through the, like the barrier between the sky and the earth and, um, and allows warmth to come into the North country. And, um, and he gets shot by these angelic kind of sky people. Um, but they're not really that angelic, they shoot arrows, I guess, but um, they, uh, they break. And so they always break the poor guy's tail. And um, so there's different things in the stories. Um, and, there's, and then there's the similar things in, in the stories. Um, and the things that I think remain the same as well are the message of the story. The message is about, you know, land stewardship, like, you know, protection of the land and climate change is a, it, I think is a, is a big issue, is a big story, which is interesting because it's an old story. You know, um, indigenous people have been talking about these things for a long time. And um, so the story is very old, but it was talking about the consequences of of not treating the land properly. Like in one version of the story, it's like an almost like an old man winter, like a like a almost like a, a god. And um, and the, the people are mistreating the earth. And so he decides he's going to do like something like Noah's Ark and he's going to like freeze everything and kill everybody off, which is very morbid, but it's, you know, that's a version of it. And start over again with people who will, who will treat the land better. So he blows all this cold air down on the land. And um, these summer birds keep um, uh, melting everything. So he gets mad at the summer birds. And so he takes them captive. And then he blows cold air again and it stays the winter. And the fisher decides that he's gonna go and try and save these summer birds um, to release them to to before everyone dies off, and he actually climbs up into the heavens to to save the summer bird. So there's different versions of it, um, and so I, I just love that story so much. And there and then there were so many different constellation stories that were as good, and um, I felt like not a lot of people knew about the story, and um, because it was so um, it was such a good story, but also I think it had important teachings. I felt like I wanted to adapt it into a novel. And so I took like the heart of that story and I, I started to look at ways that I could make it into a book because it was, it was a very short story and, um, and you needed kind of elements that would flesh it out and to make it a novel length. And I decided that it needed to have people in it. And so um, like kids, because I think, you know, I think like kids, um, and I, I talk to like thousands of kids every year and kids are like, you know, they're the best. Like, you know, they don't, they, they, they do things that adults should be doing, I, I think. So um, I thought that I want, I want two kids to help save the world because that's who's going to do it. You know, kids are going to, kids are going to be the ones who save the world, you know? So, um, so I decided I was going to put two kids in it. And, and that really came from um, the stories that I read as a kid, you know, like to get kids onto this other world, I needed to, I needed them to go through a portal. And, um, and I read portal stories a lot when I was a kid. So whether it was, um, if you haven't read this book, you should, it's called a book called Tom's Midnight Garden. It's a really good book um, by Philippa Pierce, I believe. Uh, Tom's Midnight Garden. It's a, it's a portal story. And um, so that's one of my favorite books ever. And then, um, and, and of course, Narnia is a series that, you know, I read, I read when I was a kid. And um, I, I love Narnia. I love old literature. Like, I feel like, you know, in a lot, you hear the saying, you know, they don't make them like they used to. Um, I th feel like literature is the same way. Like, I love old literature, you know, so I, I love this. I think that in a way, this series reads a bit, hopefully a bit, um, a bit like classical literature in a way, just because it has, I think it's a patient story. And I think it like, you know, it takes time with the characters, you know, middle grade usually has like, it's action, 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 action. And I feel like the Barren Grounds takes, is a bit more patient um, with the story. Um, and so, 
so but but Narnia then I thought about Narnia and I, I saw a lot of similarities between Narnia and and um the Fisher Star story and one of the biggest biggest ones was that there was a never-ending winter in both of them and so and I and there were kids going into Narnia and there and I decided I want kids going into you know this other world which I called the North Country and um and so I just like took I read Narnia over again now, if you want, if you, any of you here, three of you here are like wanting to be a writer one day, your best teachers are going to be your books. You know, they're going to be your best teachers. So you're going to learn a lot from the books that you read. Um, for me, I've learned the most from books um, to learn how to write better. And what helped me to um, write The Barren Grounds and The Great Bear and The Stone Child is is Narnia, you know, is reading how C.S. Lewis um, built the world that he created and, and how he like, you know, um, told the stories and how he developed character and all those things. I thought he really taught me a lot about um, writing in this area. And so I so Narnia and traditional stories in the land I kind of all, all smushed it together and, and made it into the barren grounds. Um, and and I think that the last thing for me is, is that every book should also have like, a, I think a message of some kind, you know, I think that every book should have something to teach. And so beyond just like teaching about the land, um, one of the things that I wanted to do with the Barren Grounds is talk about like foster care. So I made the kids foster children because they're, I think they're really, you know, underrepresented in, uh, in literature and in Canada, at least, there's a lot of foster kids, you know, and um, and most like most of the foster kids are 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 in Native American or Indigenous, uh, you know, um, foster children. So um, I wanted to like kids to learn about, you know, the foster care system. And what I love about like kids literature is, first of all, like when people recognize that kids are really smart, you know. Um, and that you can teach, you can you can talk about things in kids' literature that um, I think that we oftentimes um, we underestimate children, you know. And um, and I I try not to, you know, with with the books that I write. So um, I have a, I have a lot of faith in kids, and and so I I write I write about important things with kids because I feel like they should have the opportunity to learn about those things, and um, and so. The Bear Grounds is about foster care as well. And 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 then I think above all else, though, it's a fun adventure story um, that follows very, I think it follows um really closely the traditional story with its own, you know, I think it has its own um own little pieces to it from my own, you know, from my own imagination. But um it's a good blend of that. And uh, anyway, so the 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 Bear Grounds came out. And then I had the um, the first trilogy um, all planned out. So the Barren Grounds and the Great Bear and the Stone Child, I had I had it all mapped out from the start. So I knew exactly what was going to happen when. And then a really odd thing happened. It was odd for us, like my publisher and I. Um, we thought the Barren Grounds would do pretty well. Uh, you know, I think we had we had pretty high hopes that it would do well. Um, but it did a lot better than we thought it would do. Um, and for some reason it just caught on, you know, with, with people here in Canada, I don't, I think it's doing, um, better in the States progressively as well. And, um, and so, you know, in Canada, it's been on, it's been one of the national bestsellers for like, I think now three years straight and, and um, which is really odd. Like it's never been out of the top 10 in Canada for children's literature since it got published which is, you know, we never expected that. Um, and so when, when that happened for a consistent period of time, you know, and, and it got a lot of award attention, it never won anything, but, it, you know, it got a lot of sh um, shortlists, you know, and so um, we thought we should do more of them, you know, because I feel like if they're that popular um, and I had more ideas for stories to tell, then, you know, I thought that there was more space for more stories. And so we we decided to extend it to four books and then five books and then six books. So, um, but I think six books is where it will stop. So um, so I, it's gonna be, um, I didn't change the original trilogy. So it, it's, it's almost like two trilogies, but all the same characters. So 
Morgan and Eli and Emily becomes a very big character. Um, th those are the characters that are consistent throughout the whole series. Um, and Katie and James are there as well, the whole series, and Eric the squirrel and, um, you know, and, and the great bear, Musqua, and they're all there, um, you know, and, and uh, Ocek, obviously, you got, I won't say anything about Ocek if you haven't read the Bearing Grounds, but um, so that, so I, all the characters we're going to follow for the all six books, and um, the first three books are from Morgan's perspective, who's the main character, is, is Morgan. Um, and then the, the next three books, though, are going to be from Eli's perspective, who's the other main character. So Eli will be the focus of the last three books. And the question that I asked myself for the, the last three books is, like, how can Eli open portals was the question. And so I adapted it from a story called The Star Woman and, the, and, um, and Grandmother Spider. And, um, and so it's another constellation story, but I took that the spirit of that story and i and i adapted it into like a trilogy um because it's a big story and so it's how the star woman came to earth and and then um and lived with the kree people for a long time and 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 was gifted with a star blanket and uh so there's a big it's a big story um and so that's what the so the fourth book is actually called the star woman um which is i announced that a few months ago so that's not a big secret but um so it, that it's going to be a, another trilogy um and so i'm excited about that and then it's a whole big six book and then i'm doing one um if you haven't if you read the great bear um i'm doing a spin-off graphic novel series about the bird warriors from the great bear so it'll be the origin of these bird warriors um who are also a part of a constellation um as well the bird warriors seven bird warriors so so we're living in the world a lot. Um, there'll probably be a couple more comics as well. Um, but the Missoula saga is like a big entity now. And um, and I like living in the world. So um, I'm having fun writing it right now. And um, and it's uh, hopefully it'll go on for a little bit longer. But um, people seem to be still liking it. So uh, I think if it goes on to Disney Plus, it'll give it a bit more, uh, a bit more of, of a boost, too. So we're hoping that um, that that happens. But um, that's a little bit about the series and where I got the idea from it. And, um, you know, each book is going to come out every year still. So um, book four is coming out next year, book five the year after, book six the year after that. So uh, we're not slowing down on, you know, um, the spacing between the books. So I'm going to start working on book five pretty soon. Um, book four, we're pretty much done. So um, anyway, that's uh, that's that's the saga. But I want to um, see maybe you guys have any questions for me about the books, have you read any of them and, um, or anything you want to know about writing books or anything? You know, I've written about 30 books in my life. So um, if you want to know about just books in general or writing, then fire away. That was great. Thank you. So I know that everybody who's on the Zoom is very familiar with Zoom because you had to do it for school for the last couple of years. So if you want to ask a question in the chat, feel free to type it in and I'll read it out. If you want to ask a question um, to David directly, use the raised hand function. And that way I know that I can unmute you and you can ask your question uh, right to David. So if anybody has them, now is the time, feel free. Um, um, here you go, Moira is quick. She <laughs> says, what are your thoughts about being an Oregon Battle of the Books author? Oh, I, I think it's great. You know, I, I think that uh, any, you know, anything that, that any kind of um, competition like that or any kind of um, any way in the, which the book is recognized, especially by kids, I think is r really, really nice. Um, you know, there's a couple of programs like in in Canada that has been um, in similar things. So, you know, in, in, in Ontario, it's called the Forest of Reading. And it's pretty much a battle of the books. Like it's like a book, you know, each there's like different categories and and they pick like 10 books and they and kids kids vote on the winner. So, you know, which is you can't get more pure than that. Um, you know, like with uh with usually with awards, um adults choose a winner and a jury. And it's not about not always about what the best book is. You know, there's a lot of different um there's a lot of different like political stuff that goes into <laughs> picking winners for awards 
because I've been on I've been on a lot of juries, so I know I know kind of how it goes. Um, but um, yeah, it's nice. It's like you know, I think it's great, and I'm I'm excited too, just because it's in the states, and you know, I know that the Barren Grounds um, is you know gathering a bit of steam in the states, but um, you know, anything like this is you know really exciting to know that the book is being read by people down there, and um, so yeah, it's it's really it's really nice. So Benjamin has his hand up. So let's go to you next. So go ahead and unmute yourself, Benjamin, and ask your question. Uh, my question is, who's your favorite character in the Barren Grounds? That's a really good question. I, you know, it's funny, Benjamin, um, you know, when you write a book and especially when you write a book and then you write a lot more of the same characters in different books uh, and it becomes a series, you really get attached to the characters. You know, they, they feel like um, family almost, you know, and I, when you finish writing it, you feel like you miss them a little bit. You can't wait to go visit them again. Um, so I, I like a lot of the characters um, in the series for different reasons. Um, you know, Eli reminds me a lot of my father, um, you know, so he, my father was like very quiet and wise and, um, you know, he, he only spoke when he had something to say. And, um, and I think Eli has those qualities too. Um, I think Eric is just a fun character to write who takes on a personality of her own and does her own thing, which is really fun too. Um, I like James because like, he's very much like me in like, you know, if I was a white guy, you know, he's the same, yeah, you know, the same personality is like also he's a goof and he, you know, he doesn't really know how to talk to, you know, his kids all the time. And, um, but I, I think that my favorite character is Morgan probably. Um, I think Morgan is like a very, you know, I think she's a very complex character. Um, I think she's a very deep character. Um, and I love her arc. Like, you know, her journey over the three books, I, I think is a really good journey. And I feel like a lot of kids like her too. Um, and I also think that she's very real, you know, like she's not always mo the, the most likable person because, you know, she's been through a tough time and, um, and she, you know, she's flawed, um, but she she's really passionate and has a lot of emotions and love for people too. And I, I just, I really enjoyed writing her and I still enjoy writing her. So um, yeah, I think Morgan's my favorite character um, out of all of them. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So um, we had a question or two in the chat which have kind of been addressed when you were first talking. So for a few people who have joined us a little bit late, we are recording this and we're gonna post it on YouTube and then I'll send the link to everyone who registered. Um, but we did have a question of what inspired you to write the book. So just real quick, if you could you know, answer that question again. Yeah, um, a, a lot of different things. So um, it was, it was um, you know, a, a, a bigger appreciation for like, the land and the environment. Um, it was traditional stories of the stars that I've been learning a lot of over the last several years. And, and Narnia was a big inspiration as well. So it was taking all those things and like, you know, blending it all up and make it in, into something new. And actually when I pitched it to my publisher, uh, I pitched it as like an, an indigenous Narnia. You know, that's, that's what I pitched it as. And they really liked that idea. So that's, that's what it became. So um, that's what that's what inspired the the barren grounds. Um, you know, as someone who who works also in in publishing, um, because I I'm an editor outside of the bookstore, that's a pretty big pitch. I mean, to obviously you had some you know books sell well before, and you know you have that background. But when I talk to authors and they're like, "Well, I want to compare my book to." you know, John Grisham, because they write kind of these spy thrillers. I'm like, let's bring it down a little. But I love that your confidence to say like, it's, it's a, a newer Narnia, you know, without maybe like, there are so, a lot of religious overtones in Narnia. Yeah. And yours are the more, the cultural religion of indigenous people. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big swing and you, and you hit it. Like, <laughs> well, I think that, you know, I think it's done well. I don't know if I would, I would, I don't know if I would say it's like, you know, it's on the Narnia level, but 
you know, I think that what I what I loved about the series, aside from just writing it, is that I've heard a lot from teachers and parents and kids that it's got them excited about re reading, which is, you know, that's been nice for me to hear. You know, a kid who, you know, may not have been a big reader before, you know, has like devoured the barren grounds or, is, you know, then, you know, I think that that means a lot to me because um, like reading is such an important thing to do. And um, if I get kids excited about reading books, then um, I think that's that's like a, a big win in itself. Um, but I, I, I do feel like if you don't expect the best out of yourself, then, you know, I, I think that you're selling yourself short. So if I didn't think that I could write a really good series that, you know, would would at least compare in some way to Narnia, then I don't know if I would have done it, you know, so I, I, do, I guess I do have a bit of confidence in in what I do. But I also don't think that I feel like I'm anything special. I just like I just work. I just work really hard, you know, and uh, I try to write good stories. So. Well, and I love that you have, I mean, you have something to say, you know, you have the back and up of, of talking about things we need to hear about climate change. Um, we had another question that you've kind of covered, which is talking about foster kids. And, you know, you said you want to talk about that because there's a lot of Indigenous kids who end up in the foster care system. And it happens far too often in the United States as well. Actually, there is a case before the U.S. Supreme Court right now which depending on how it's deciding could unravel the um, like a 1973 uh, Indian act about welfare, about children's welfare. I mean, it's still something in the US that needs to be addressed. So I appreciate yeah. that you're bringing that to, to a new generation. Well, I think, you know, one of the, I think it's important just for kids to know in general that, you know, like with foster care in Canada, almost 60% of the kids in foster care are indigenous. That is a big number, yeah. you know, um, especially when you think about the fact that 6% of kids are indigenous and you have then 60% are in foster care. That's 10 times that that's a lot, you know, and it, it is rooted in like colonialism and, you know, racism. And, you know, I think that, you can talk about those things with kids on, at, at an age appropriate level. And I think that books are a good way to do that. So um, it is a, it's a big problem, you know, foster care. It's like, it's like, you know, it's a second, you know, for in the States, I think they were called boarding schools um, mm -hmm. in, in Canada, they're re residential schools. Um, but it's a second, it's a second version of that really. Um, and it's still, go, it's still going on. So um, I think it's worth like learning about. So if you can do it in, in a fantasy book, you know, fan, there's a lot of truth in fiction, so. Absolutely. Now, I want to ask a question um, as someone who has not had a chance yet to read the book and is now going to be putting in my to be read list. Read list. <laughs> do Morgan and Eli know each other before they go into foster care? Uh, no, they, um, they, they're, they're placed into the same home, um, but they don't, they haven't met before. So Morgan um, is there first and she's been there, I think for like two or three months. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then Eli is brought into the home and he's only been there for like a week or two, um, when the, when the book starts. And, um, I think one of the beautiful things about the series is that Morgan and Eli really develop, um, a, a strong relationship between the, two, between the two of them. And they become like, they see themselves as brothers and sisters, you know, as, as the series goes on. But yeah, when they, when, the, when the series starts, they don't know each other at all. So um, they just, they've just met. Yeah. And Benjamin um, wants to, ben yeah, wants Benjamin, to let's chime in about that. Go ahead. So I just kind of had a question. So um, during this writing process, did you ever get writer's block or did you get stuck on a certain part? Yeah. I mean, the, the, Definitely. I, I still get days where you just, I think it's like, there's days where you just don't feel like writing. You know, I feel like there's days where you just don't feel like inspired and it's just, it's, it feels more like work than it does. And, and all, I think there always will be days like that. Um, the best way to get over writer's block is first of all, to have some sort of a plan or an outline, because then if you don't, even if you don't feel like writing, you can at least follow your blueprints and you can get like some words down 
and you can write through it in a way, you know, just push through it, um, which I've tried to do. Um, you know, I think another way to do it would be to just maybe put the book aside for maybe a half hour and just do some journaling, you know, just write anything and just to kind of get that kind of blood flowing in, in your writing muscles. You know, I think that is something you can do. Um, or then sometimes it's just taking a break and going for a walk and like, or just, you know, listening to some music or reading a book and, uh, and then coming back to it and maybe you feel a little more refreshed and ready to go. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to overcome, you know, what a lot of people call writer's block. Um, and I certainly, there's certainly days where I, you know, I don't feel like writing. Um, but I think the discipline of getting work done, um, it's just making it a habit and doing it even when you don't feel like it. Um, and you can always edit it and fix it after, you know, so editing is where editing is really where you get a book, um, done and ready to be published. Um, the first draft is always bad, you know, um, you, you have to fix it after. So that's why it's okay to get bad words down because if the story is good, that's the end goal, right? So. Thank you. Do You're you welcome. have um, beta readers who read your first drafts and give you feedback? I'm not, no, not really. I mean, uh, I've, been doing, I've been doing it long enough now where I, I can kind of go through a first draft myself and get it like to a point where it's publishable um, but I still need to do a lot of work on it with editors. Like I work with about three editors in every book. So there's a substantive editor, which changes a lot of stuff. Right. Then there's like line and copy editors that change little things. Um, and there's continuity editors that make sure that things are consistent. Um, so you have a lot of help when you're writing a book. Um, but, uh, I, I, I don't have any beta readers. I, I, I'm good enough now that I can read through a book that I've done in the first draft and, and get it into a good place on the second draft enough that I can send it into the publisher and then they can, you know, do their work. But, um, I, I, I mean, sometimes I let my kids read something, but I, I really don't usually have anybody read them before I send it into the publisher. Yeah. So if any of you are interested in becoming writers later, um, look into writing groups, which you can start now if you just have a group of friends that also likes to write and but beta readers are people who really like the genre that you write in. And so they'll usually give you like feedback. They're not editors, but they're people who just read a lot. Um, I've been a beta reader for a couple of friends just because I had the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really good to have a writing community around you too. Um, so I wanted to ask a question of everyone who's on the Zoom with us right now, and you, if you want to put it in the chat, that would be great, because David brought it up that, you know, his book was published in Canada and then has made its way filtered through into the States and now, you know, is part of OBOB. So had anyone ever heard of this book before it was put on the OBOB list? I just want to know, because I think that that's, that OBOB is bringing your book to hundreds of kids, you know, maybe even more with this. Um, and that's why we have so many kids who are joining us from outside of the immediate area of our bookstore is that we opened it up to anybody in the state who was part of OBOB and said, come to this event and talk with this author. So um, yeah, so Moira had it before. That's really cool. So um, Benjamin's mom has a question and this is exactly what I was curious about too. Um, sending your story to Disney and then seeing where it goes without as much control as you do of the book. Um, yeah, it, it's a little nerve wracking to see um, how they'll change the story because something will always change. You know, they'll they'll add stuff. Um, and I'm more concerned that they, um, you know, that they employ indigenous actors, um, that they have indigenous people involved in the writing team, you know, the writing room, um, that they have, you know, maybe a couple of indigenous directors. Um, and, and I've talked with the producers about that. Um, so I'm, that's what, what concerns me more than, you know, really like the, the title card is going to read inspired by the barren grounds or 
spaced off the barren ground. So, I mean, they can take the, the story that I wrote and they can make it into something a little different. And, um, and that's okay. You know, like I think as long as they do justice to the heart of the story, um, I think that's what I, you know, what I'll be happy with that. And if they, I think as well, if they, again, if they employ like the right people who are representative of, you know, um, I think it would be like, you know, pretty, um, not ironic, but I wrote it to represent accurately indigenous people, you know, um, as an in indigenous writer. So it would really upset me if they took it and they anglicized it, you know, like, I think that would be but I don't, I don't think they'll do that. Um, you know, I, I, the people involved in it, I've met with them and a couple of them are, you know, I think they're really, really big Hollywood actors who, um, who I, I'm, they've assured me that, you know, they, they want to do it the right way. So, um, I, I, I have trust that they'll do that. Um, I don't know how much say I'll have or how much involvement, um, they've talked about, you know, bringing me on in some capacity. Um, maybe as even just a consultant or, you know, and um, I'm perfectly, you know, happy to do that. Or they don't have to, though, you know, like they, they bought the rights to it so they can do whatever they want. And, you know, in that in those in that option agreement, you know, there's benefits that I get if it does this or that or whatever it might be. But um, uh, like uh, but. Really, for me, the benefit is going to be seeing it on the screen and, you know, and how, how that will hopefully, like, continue to reach kids. Um, but I think it will also help, you know, bring the book to more people. Mm -hmm. You know, the, really, in the end, having it on Disney Plus or even if it made into a movie, it'll just bring the book to more people. And that's that's what I'll, I think, that's where I'll get the most out of it. Um, it'll be neat to see Morgan on the screen and see, you know, how they depict her. That'll be kind of fun. But um, yeah, it's um, it is a little. I'm a little nervous about seeing how they do it if it gets made. Um, but it's also kind of exciting too. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, um, let's see here. Let me check the chat to see if we have any other questions. Um, it looks like we do. The question is, why do you like writing about an adventure of a bear? Well, my dad uh, used to tell me that the bear was our relative, you know. Um, so, like, my family has a, a reverence and spiritual connection to the bear. And there is a story of the bear in, a, in one of the constellation stories. So, um, I just include, I love bears, you know, I love bears and, and I love whales. Um, and I just felt like including a bear in the story and having them as a, you know, big character in it, like Musk was a big character in, in all the stories. So um, I just felt like I wanted to do justice to like um, the story, but I also wanted to honor my dad in a way. And I feel like, especially now that he's passed away, like, I feel like it was a good way to, you know, honor my father in in his connection to the bear and so that's why i wrote about the bear and uh, included him as a big character you know when my dad died i got got it like these like you know these bear tattoos too you know there's these bear this one's this one's like a map this one's actually a map um to my dad's trap line we look to there and this one is like um is a bear paw with like um cree a cree word on it in syllabic so um, so the bear is just like, you know, really important uh, in my life. And it's also a connection to my father. So all those reasons are why I wrote about the bear. Thank you for showing those to us. Um, so I guess I want to ask a question about using Indigenous words. Uh, I mentioned before we started this that I really enjoyed um, Firekeeper's Daughter which, you know, uses a lot of the characters' indigenous words. Do you, like, do you include any sort of, um, like, pronunciation guide in the back or any kind of, like, what the words mean? So, so on, you know, our information about the book, 
um, the word misawa is Cree for all that is. Elders say that what is above is mirrored below, and this is the connection we have with misawa. So what does it mean to you to kind of bring that to, again, another maybe a generation, um, not indigenous children, but still children nonetheless to kind of learn these words? There is a glossary. Ben was pretty quick to put up a glossary, which was nice. Yes, um, <laughs> yeah, um, there is a glossary in it, I think. But like language re revitalization is a big movement in Canada. So, you know, like having the having the Cree language, for example, uh, in a mainstream literature, it, I think it's helpful for Cree kids who, you know, who see their language in a book that is, you know, on a bestseller list and um, they can learn some words in their own language. I think it's nice, um, but I think it's also nice to have kids who aren't indigenous um, learning Cree words. You know, like I've had a, a presentation to a, a entire school division. There was like a thousand kids, you know, on Zoom or whatever, and you know they they all said hi to me in Cree, and that that was kind of nice, right? So, um, so it's, I think it's. In a lot of ways, it's been nice to include the Cree language in in my books um, for for indigenous kids, but also for non-indigenous kids for different reasons. Um, and so that's why I've used the language more and more in in the literature that I do. So whether it's you know the picture books on the trap line, for example, or um, you know the Misawa saga, or you know um, when we were alone, which is my uh, you know first picture book, um, you know. I, I even in my memoir Blackwater, I, I had all the chapter titles in Cree, you know, so it, it's um, and a lot of Cree language in it. So it's just important for me for those reasons. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you. Well, we've got about ten minutes. Hey. <laughs> um, yes, thank you in Cree. And Moira, thank you for putting it in the chat that it was in the front. It was actually Moira that commented that it was there. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, um, Moira. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that comment too, Benjamin. You guys have been a really great audience tonight as well. So I hope you'll let your friends know that if they're interested in reading this book and want to watch this um, chat that we've just had, that I will post the link to it in the Facebook group, but I'm also going to email it to everybody who had RSVP'd on Eventbrite, um, because we just want more kids to keep reading these books and telling their friends that they should read these books. It's the best way uh, to get them around is word of mouth. So if we've got any more questions, let's do them now. This will be our last few. Um, if not, David, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us, to share about the inspiration of your book. And I really do hope you we see it on Disney+. Plus. I think it sounds like it would be really, really cool. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, kids, for uh, coming out. It was nice to see you. I hope you enjoy the series, and I just hope you keep reading generally. So um, thanks, and thanks for Roundabout Books for, uh, for having me out to speak to you. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. I want to wish you guys a uh, great evening. If you have books that you're looking for, make sure and check out your local independent bookstore because independent bookstores are where it's at. So keep reading and uh, happy almost holidays, everybody. <laughs> All right, we'll sign off for now. I'm going to stop the recording. Mm -hmm.